So my favorite television show of all time is probably The Cosby Show. And after all of the allegations against Bill Cosby, I have to admit it's kind of hard to watch, especially certain episodes. Well, now, it certainly is nice to see them work things out for themselves. They haven't worked anything out for themselves. It's my barbecue sauce. But at the end of the day, I'm still okay with calling it my favorite show. The shitty behavior of this individual doesn't, for me, diminish the brilliant work done by the many people who worked on this great show. On the other hand, I pretty much can't listen to R. Kelly anymore. And if you don't know the deal with R. Kelly, basically it's been known for kind of a long time that he probably has pedophilic tendencies. And failing that, all of the accusations against him involved him abusing his status to take advantage of young women in general. Although, like Bill Cosby and many other people who are accused of sexual misconduct, he's managed to evade any legal consequences. But I used to be a pretty big fan of R. Kelly. I mean, Ignition Remix kind of goes hard, you have to admit. But there's only so long you can ignore stuff like this. But this seems like an inconsistency. In one case, I'm able to separate a person from their work, but in another situation, I'm not. So that made me sit down and really think about why that is. <laughs> Hi, I'm T1J. Follow me. So recently, a lot of formerly beloved figures in media and entertainment have been accused of some pretty fucked up things. And this has been difficult for those of us who were fans of the work these people put out. It's rough when it's someone you like. Like when Bill O'Reilly lost his job at Fox because of multiple sexual harassment cases, I was like, makes sense, fuck that guy. But I think we've all learned a lesson about deifying celebrities. Just because you make stuff that people like doesn't mean you're an awesome person. Now, like I said, before, the creator of something you love being awful doesn't magically make that thing not good anymore. There's definitely some separation between an artist and their art, but it kind of feels dirty to support the work of someone that you know is a creep. Now, in general, I would say it's important to keep some detachment between an artist and their work. This allows for creative expression of ideas and depictions that the person probably wouldn't normally express. For example, the movie Funny Games is basically just a hundred minutes of meaningless violence violence from which there is no real closure or resolution. But it would probably be wrong to accuse writer-director Mikhail Hanukkah of being in support of meaningless violence. He was using his art to express an idea about violence. Taylor Swift writes a lot of songs where she complains about her past relationships. A lot of them. And maybe this means she's just a vindictive emotional basket case? But probably she's just a normal human being with feelings who has chosen a creative and lucrative outlet for expressing those feelings. So in general, I would actually argue that it's usually not a good idea to judge someone based on their creative work. I mean, feel free to criticize the actual creation if you hate it, but I think creative people need space to use their art to express sometimes dark and offensive ideas without being accused of being evil people. We all have dark thoughts from time to time, but the difference is artists sometimes want to express those ideas in a safe and creative way. However, sometimes the disparity between art and artists gets a little blurry. In the song Kim, rapper Eminem fantasizes about brutally murdering his ex-wife named Kim. Now it's unlikely that Eminem actually planned to murder Kim, but the song is called Kim. It's about a real person. That's her real name. And it was well known by that point that the two were having relationship problems. You know, it's one thing for Taylor Swift to vaguely reference real situations as a form of expression, but actually calling real people out and referencing real situation really blurs the line between art and reality. Like if I were Kim or someone who cared about Kim around about that time, I think I'd be justified in being a little concerned. At the end of the day, I think it's pretty obvious that the song was just a way for Eminem to express his anger and frustration in a creative way. And most critics call Kim one of Eminem's best songs because of its visceral quality. And its clever tightrope walk of the line between fact and fiction. But sometimes art does get a little too real. And I think that is the key for me. Comedian Louis C.K. finally confirmed the rumors of his sexual misconduct recently. And beyond the fact that what he did was disgusting, the most disturbing part to me was that his stand-up act and his television show constantly made references to his own sexual perversion. But it was played up for laughs. He was known as a socially aware comedian because he often acknowledged the harassment and oppression that marginalized groups face including women. And he would often use himself as a stand-in for the creepy guys that women deal with as part of his comedy routines. But now we know it wasn't a stand-in. He is that creepy guy that women deal with. So it's almost like he was trying to use his comedy to justify his personal shitty behavior to himself or even worse, to us. Like in this case, the art and the artist 
is the same and it's pretty much not possible to separate the two things. And going back to R. Kelly, it's a similar situation. You may know that R. Kelly illegally married singer Aaliyah when she was 15 years old and he was 27. And even though no one knew this until the story hit the news, many former friends and members of his entourage suspected that he was having an inappropriate relationship with her. A few months before that, Aaliyah released her debut album called Age Ain't Nothing But A Number. This album was primarily produced and written by R. Kelly. Now the title, Age Ain't Nothing But A Number, could reference the fact that Aaliyah was this young girl breaking into the industry who could stand with the grown-ups even though she was just 15. However, there's a song on the album, also called Age Ain't Nothing But A Number, in which Aaliyah sings about wanting a relationship with an older man. This song was written by R. Kelly. So if you didn't catch all that, R. Kelly, a grown man who was probably having an inappropriate relationship with a teenage girl, wrote a song for that little girl to sing about how it's okay for grown men to be in relationships with little girls. If that doesn't eradicate the line between art and artist, I don't know what does. And these types of accusations have been made against R. Kelly pretty much his entire career, sometimes very credibly. For example, did you know that the police literally found child pornography in his home but had to throw out the case because the judge invalidated their search warrant? So it's really hard for me to hear about R. Kelly singing about putting his key in somebody's ignition and not think he's talking about a teenage girl. Kind of ruins the whole thing, you know? R. Kelly actually calls himself the Pied Piper of R&B. Yeah. It's the Pied Piper of R&B, y'all. Do you know the story of the Pied Piper? Like, do you know what that character did? I think R. Kelly is trolling us. Now, because these types of things happen, sometimes we can't help but be a little suspicious when people create things that raise our eyebrow a little bit. Like, I'm a huge fan of Quentin Tarantino, but many people have criticized him for how often the characters in his movies say the N-word, which is quite a bit to be fair. He even seems to frequently find ways to make himself say it in his movies. So it's like, what is this dude's obsession with the N-word? And it kind of makes you scratch your head a little bit. Got my eye on you, Quentin. So honestly, after all this nonsense, I'm actually more likely to separate art from artists because it seems like you never know who's gonna turn out to be an awful creep. And I can't just have everything I love be constantly ruined for me. It's like, I'll take that cool stuff you made, but other than that, go away, I don't know you. But when those creations seem to be directly informed or inspired by real life shitty behavior, it becomes a lot harder for me to let that go. That's just me though. What do you think? Thank you for watching my video. Let's check the voicemail. Hey, T1J, long time listener, first time caller. Say, uh, you have long said that Alabama is a red state, deeply red, and it certainly is, but you're in a unique situation right now with uh, Doug Jones. So uh, how are you feeling about your senatorial special election? That you've been asked this a lot of times, but I sure would like to hear your perspective on it. Thanks for your time. Calling from Al Franken's Minnesota. Bye-bye. So I think I've made my feelings on Trump very clear in social media and in videos, but I think Roy Moore is worse than Trump. He's a relentless theocratic extremist with zero respect for democracy or the Constitution. He doesn't even pretend to give a shit about the things that our country stands for. And also, apparently, he's a pedophile. Despite all that, he's still the front runner for becoming Alabama's next senator. But his Democratic opponent, Doug Jones, is closer than anyone has been to defeating a Republican in an Alabama Senate race in 30 years. And the last Democrat we elected, Richard Shelby, switched to the Republican Party halfway through his second term. So yeah, Doug Jones winning would be pretty extraordinary for Alabama. Now Jones is a pretty standard mainstream Democrat. He's not some kind of revolutionary progressive. But for Alabama, having a left-leaning senator would be a big deal, even if his opposition wasn't so objectionable. So I'm not like super hype on Doug Jones, but he's fine. Of the two choices, he's clearly easily the better choice. His opponent is a disgusting person with abhorrent beliefs. So I'm going to enthusiastically vote for Doug Jones and encourage my peers to do the same. But thanks for calling. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, call the number on your screen and leave me a voicemail. And maybe I'll respond to it in a future video. If you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you're not subscribed, click that subscribe button for more videos like this one. And don't forget to ring that notification bell to make sure you never miss a video. And if you'd like to support me or this channel more directly, consider becoming a patron on Patreon. My patrons amazingly helped me reach the $1,000 goal a few months ago. And my next goal is to reach the $2,000 threshold, at which point I can make a serious upgrade to the professionalism of my main show and my live show. So if you'd like to help me accomplish these goals, check out the link to my Patreon page in the description or at the end of this video. And if you want more details about what I'm planning for this channel, go to my Patreon page and check out the goals section. And thanks as always to my gorgeous patrons, and remember, stay hake up.